uh, we're very pleased to have you here for our June event at the, with the New York Society for General Semantics. And uh, also want to remind you that our events come to you free of charge and uh, that we encourage that you become members of the Institute of General Semantics if, if you have not already and that we are the proud co-sponsors of the Alfred Krzyzewski Memorial Lecture in October um, which will feature Diane Ackerman uh, this year um, mm -hmm. and uh, of the symposium that follows which uh, uh, there is already a call for participation that is out, and, uh, and we'll, of course, be sharing that as well as other things uh, through us. But uh, um, if anyone has gone to the Institute of General Semantics website recently, you may have found that it was down for a little bit. Um, this is to get it in, in uh, working uh, order. Well, no, not in working <laughs> order, but improved. No, you may have heard that the European Union has, has passed very stringent privacy rules. Everywhere around, you probably have gotten messages about the GDPR um, and, and, and these changes. And so our, our um, very hardworking uh, webmaster, Ben Houck, has been, uh, had to revise the uh, IGS website to get it um, consistent compliant. with compliant. Thank you, that's the word I was looking for. Wow. Wow. Yes, because we are international, right? Here we're we're just New York, you know. So if you're not from New York, well, screw you, baby. But IGS is international. You didn't like that, I'm sorry. No, it's international. Thought that was a lead to me. Yeah. What are the dates of the conference? It's the last weekend in October. October. October 26th for the AKML, and then 27th and 28th. For the symposium to follow. Uh, could we turn the music off, please? I, I know, but it's hard to, to hear, especially. I don't know if we'll be able to cut this out from the online version. Um, if not, uh, I apologize to those viewing this on YouTube. Um, but I, it's my very great pleasure now to introduce uh, the trustee of the Institute of General Semantics and uh, member of the board of directors of the New York Society for General Semantics, Jackie Ruddick, or oh, trustee, I should say, tre treasurer of the Institute of General Semantics. Yay. Yay. Um, who will, Yay. who will lead us tonight in, uh, in our panel discussion. And you're a treasure. Oh. Thank you. Oh. Oh. Treasure oh. and treasure. Nice. And, and treasure from Milwaukee, so. International. I didn't say this there. <laughs> Intergalactic. Yeah. Um, Trump is speaking in Milwaukee tonight, and oh. that's oh. why you're in New York. <laughs> Welcome to everyone, and thank you for attending tonight's panel discussion of the unique ways Tom Wolfe and his work have influenced the way we view the world. Thomas Kennerly Wolfe was a celebrated journalist, an accomplished author, a recipient of numerous professional as well as humanitarian awards. And as you all know, just a few months ago, Tom died right here in New York City, the city he loved and where he lived most of his adult life. He was 88 years old, and he kept right on writing right up to the end. Tom's career began when, after an unsuccessful pitching tryout with the New York Giants, wow. he decided to go to Yale instead. In 1957, Yale awarded him a PhD, a PhD in American Studies, which um, he was very disappointed in, and he had to rewrite it several times. And um, never had anything good to say about it later. He said it ruined his writing style for several years and he had to work hard to get out of that mode. So all the academic care. Yeah. Yeah. But, <laughs> yeah. sorry, but he did say that. So he got a PhD in American studies. And then as Tom himself liked to say, he spent the rest of his life studying America. Studying America as a journalist, an author, an essayist, an interviewer, 
as a student and scholar of language, media, and communication. He's studying America as a critic of art and architecture, always, always studying America, chronicling American culture from acid to astronauts through his gift with words. By the end of his prolific life, Tom had become a much sought after member of the Manhattan Intelligentsia and a famous raconteur in his trademark white suit. Each year, as Lance mentioned, the Institute of General Semantics awards the S.I. Hayakawa Prize for a recent outstanding work directly related to the field of general semantics. We do this as part of our annual dinner, and uh, which is co-sponsored by the New York Society, and uh, which, to which you're all invited, and we attend for free if you're a member. And last October, this prize went to Tom Wolfe for what turned out to be his final work, The Kingdom of Speech. It's a highly controversial uh, book and critiqued for being, um, he critiqued Chomsky's approach to linguistics and also criticized Darwin's theory of evolution. Um, he said the theory of evolution is the nuttiest theory he's ever heard. <laughs> he was a conservative. Um, the Institute of General Semantics and New York Society are honored that tonight, um, or that at that night, Tom and his wife accepted the invitation to our dinner, and he gave a gracious ex acceptance speech and listened to our keynote speaker, and then stayed afterwards to socialize and sign copies of his book. He was a delightful guest, so that's part of the reason we yep, feel yep. reminiscent. Of, and he was a wonderful man, and whom we all had the pleasure of meeting that night. So tonight, the New York Society will honor his contributions and celebrate his achievements with a special panel discussion on select aspects of his career and publications. Uh, one of our pan panel members, uh, Terry McLuhan, was ill and could not make it, so we have assembled for you a panel of the right stuff. <laughs> beginning with... <laughs> to your right. Uh, <laughs> to my right. I have Tom Gencarelli, who is chairman of the communication department at Manhattan College and member of the Board of Trustees of the Institute of General Semantics and the Board of Directors of the New York Society. He's also the new editor of the Institute's Quarterly Journal, etc., of the View of General Semantics, which you can receive for free if you become a member of the Institute. And then uh, Marty Levinson, who's the author of several books on general semantics, including a forthcoming, forthcoming new edition of Practical Fairy Tales for Everyday Living. Marty is the president of the Institute and treasurer of the New York Society. Uh, Sherry McLuhan, as I said, uh, could not make it, and I'm sure she'll make up for it another time. And then Lance, whom we thank for setting up this get-together tonight, he has also authored several books, including the award-winning Media Ecology, An Approach to Understanding the Human Condition. Lance is professor of communication and media studies at Fordham University, a trustee of the Institute of General Semantics and president of the New York Society, as I'm sure you all know. So now we can begin the discussion with open remarks to each of our panelists and maybe talking about your view and experience of Tom for his, his work and why you're just so very glad to be here tonight to talk about that. Would you, would you like to bring in Tom? Thank you. 
percent, but the top 20. Uh, I, I, I looked up to them and I was influenced by them a great deal. And, and in fact, I, I never felt that I was anywhere near as smart as any of them. Uh, in particular, I wasn't as smart as the guy who was ranked number three in that graduating class, who went on to study mathematics at MIT, and who last I heard was in Las Vegas counting cards. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, or the guy who was not only a really accomplished and, and virtuoso pianist, uh, who arranged the theme from the Flintstones television program for our, our school stage bands, but who went on to earn a PhD in theoretical physics from the uh, University of California at Berkeley. I, I may not have felt that I was as smart as them, but I liked them a lot, and I was a lot like them. For one thing, unlike most high school students these days, we all read a lot of books, outside of books assigned to us in school. We read for pleasure, for fun, and to learn stuff. There was, though, one regard in which I wasn't really that much like them. They were all freaks. At least that's what we called them. They were heads. They smoked a lot of pot. They experimented with LSD. This was the you know mid-1970s, after all. They had more hair on their heads at that time than I've had in my entire life. Um, they listened to the Grateful Dead and sometimes followed them on tour. As a matter of fact, they all went to what is arguably the most legendary Dead concert of them all, the infamous Barton Hall show at Cornell University in May of 1977. That was my first. Oh, legendary. Um, I, by the way, I only followed the Dead once and it was just for a long weekend. Um, anyway, so, this is important with respect to the subject of our discussion tonight, Tom Wolfe, and his second book, because, because that book is about Ken Kesey, the novelist and author of One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, and sometimes a great notion, uh, and his band of merry pranksters, uh, in particular, prankster sidekick numero uno, Neil Cassidy. Um, uh, and, and a quick editorial aside, uh, I played the role of Randall P. McMurphy. I'll answer. <laughs> um, I, I played the role of Randall P. McMurphy in our high school's production of One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, and, and one of my buddies from this group uh, played Chief Bromden. But anyway, it, <laughs> it was Kesey, principally at the Oregon farm that he bought with the proceeds from his two novels, uh, but also up and down the West Coast and all across the rest of the country, and, and down in Mexico as the pranksters you know, rambled and roved about on their bus. Remember the, the adage, right? You're either on the bus or you're off the bus, yeah. right? Uh, it was Kesey who financed and orchestrated the acid tests of said title and carried them out with the help of Augustus Owsley Stanley III, <coughs> the LSD chemist who was also the architect of the Grateful Dead's huge and hugely expensive wall of sound sound system from that time. The Dead themselves, the pranksters, and some Hell's Angels from the Crooked Men. Um, and so I encountered this book when I found it sitting on the desk of one of these friends. I was intrigued by the title. I took the book. I don't think I ever gave it back. And I began to learn most of this story of this social and, and uh, cultural history of uh, Kesey and the Pranksters. And maybe I started to learn to write a bit at the same time. The second Wolf book that I read was published not long after this, The Right Stuff. Uh, I read this book, however, for a different more personal, uh, perhaps a more individualistic reason. From the time that I was three years old until I was about 14, my father worked for Pan American Airlines. I remember take your kid to work days. <laughs> he would take me to his office in Hangar 14 at uh, the recently renamed JFK Airport. Uh, I remember seeing Pan Am's first Boeing 747 jumbo jet up close and on the ground. And I don't remember whether it was a British Airways or an Air France Concord sitting there on the tarmac. Uh, most of all, I remember being something of, a, of an airline brat. Back in the days when flying was fun, it was cool, it was even kind of glamorous. I used to love family vacations when sometimes we would end up sleeping overnight on couches in a terminal because we had to wait for an early morning flight because we always had to fly standby. Uh, and I always got the window seat even though I had two sisters. <laughs> <laughs> space race, and I voraciously read everything that I could get my hands on about the Gemini and the Apollo programs. I was a little too young to have experienced the, the Mercury program. 
And, and of course I watched it all on television too. Who needed to see Ron Howard's, you know, Apollo 13 movie featuring Tom Hanks as Jim Lovell when I was I was glued to the television set the whole time that it happened in real time. Uh, they even wheeled a, a television set, it was, it was in April, they wheeled a television set into our classroom in school and let us watch it during the day. So so to date myself, I was I was 10 years old when Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin landed the lunar module, right, the Eagle, and, and walked on the moon. Let's not forget poor Mike Collins orbiting around up there to make sure everybody <laughs> got home, right? It's so close, I never got to, to set foot there. But so when the right stuff came out, it was just, it was a continuation and encapsulation of this story that I thought I knew so much about just seven years after it had all ended, right? The first space shuttle uh, would not launch for another two years after the right stuff came out. And Wolf filled in the many loose ends that I never knew, uh, uh, but also wrote about the people, about you know Chuck Yeager, and John Glenn, and, and Alan Shepard, and, and uh, Virgil Gus Grissom, God rest his, his unfortunate soul. He wrote about them as though he knew all of them personally, as though he was down there in Cape Canaveral with them. I never could have become a pilot because, you know, obviously I also grew up during the Vietnam War and I could never be that guy responsible for shooting down another human being in his plane or for bombing a village. And at, at that point it was all pilots, not scientists and engineers who became astronauts. But I loved this stuff. It was formational in, in my life. The third book that I read during my graduate education was the painted word. And, and I promised Molly I wouldn't step on his toes about this book. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I read the painted word expressly because I went to graduate school to study art as communication, and in particular music as communication. I, I went on to graduate study because I wanted to understand, and, and the following is the language that I developed once I got there, what the non-discursive, non-linguistic, symbolic systems that we humans have developed, what, what they communicate. I wanted to understand how and what they mean, what, what meaning is when it's not based on our common denominator symbolic system for all that we tend to consider meaningful and, and to which we default, which of course are, are our myriad verbal languages that our species has devised. And so the painted word then, for those who have never read it, you know, it's a very brief, a very concise book that goes something like this traces the history of visual art as a series of movements, or philosophies, if you will. And this is to say two things. First, art is not like ideas. Art never evolves or move, moves forward in such a way that you know we get smarter or we know more when we arrive at immutable truths. It never develops in such a way that the artists or their art get better. Art just gets different. Sure, you know, there is across all of our media arts and across time a constant standard for what is great, what's not so great, what's average, what's below average, and, and what sucks. But what the artist tries to do is to create something different that both takes its place as great work in the history of art and which thereby leaves the artist's stamp or, or signature. And in doing so, achieves for him or her a kind of immortality. Second, and this isn't a contradiction, art is very much like ideas, or at least it is wholly about ideas. The ways that art changes and becomes different is all a matter of ideas about art. And Wolf ends his book kind of abruptly when, you know, after the church's commissioned religious iconography and biblical scenes evolved at the time of the Renaissance into secular art, and then later into Impressionism as an exercise in and a philosophy about the medium of painting. And then later into abstraction where we no longer paint things we see in the world and in our field of vision, but we make up images in our heads or on the canvas. And then later to questions about the very nature of what is art and what is not art, right? In the, in the movements of Dada and, and pop art, right? All of this finally comes to an end of sorts, an end of art with Wolf's examples of art turning into pure theory, wherein we finally and formally, formally, not formerly, formally, dispensed with the art itself and just
painted the words, the, the instructions that explained and explicated the philosophy that undergirded it. And, and to what and where art has, has come to toward the end of the 20th century. So I, I also began to read, but for some reason never finished Radical Sheik and Mau Mau and the Flag Catchers. Uh, of course, I read The Bonfire of the Vanities, and I say of course because didn't every self-defining and self-respecting New Yorker? No. <laughs> and I also have my signed copy of The Kingdom of Speech sitting toward mm. the very top of the pile on my nightstand at home. Um, but let me end these opening remarks with, with this. It, it's not a wolf book, but a wolf article. What if he is right? From the Sunday Magazine section of the New York Herald Tribune, which, which by the way, later survived to become New York Magazine. Or, or to give the article its full title, um, suppose he is what he sounds like, the most important thinker since Newton, Darwin, Freud, Einstein, and Pavlov, what if he is right? For this article published in 1965, when I was only five years old, 14 years before I first read McLuhan, and 18 years before I started my graduate education, this book had as much impact on me as the three books that I've spoken about. It speaks to why a kid from the 1960s, a kid from the first television generation, a kid who watched the aftermath of the Kennedy assassination and the Beatles on the Ed Sullivan show as a three-year-old, a kid from the space age, a kid who was too young to protest in favor of civil rights and against the Vietnam War, a kid who grew up with the disposition of an artist, a kid who was marked and influenced by the waning days of free post-literate culture, and a kid who grew up into a right-brained person trying to live a left-brained existence, explains ultimately uh, why I turned into who I have become. In Wolf's words, it goes something like this. McLuhan has developed a theory that goes like this. The new technologies of the electronic age, notably television, radio, the telephone, and computers make up a new environment. A new environment. They are not merely added to some basic human environment. The idea that these things, TV and the rest, are just tools that men can use for better or worse depending on their talents and moral strength, that idea is idiotic to McClure. The new technologies such as television have become a new environment. They radically alter the entire way people use their five senses, the way they react to things, and therefore their entire lives and the entire society. It doesn't matter what the content of a medium like TV is. It doesn't matter if the network showed 20 hours a day of sadistic cowboys caving in people's teeth or 20 hours of Pablo Casals droning away on his cello in pure culture white Spanish drawing room. It doesn't matter about the content. The most profound effect of television, its real message in McLuhan's terms, is the way it alters men's sensory patterns. As Neil Postman wrote and then spoke before it was written down for posterity, media ecology is general semantics writ large. But for me, like for Neil, and for Kwasiewski, and for Wolf, it all begins with and from language. And it begins with and from language, not only in settings like this one, talking, but from that pre post-literate moment in time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Sure. Um, well, uh, a lot of uh, what I have to say um, First thing um, that uh, I encounter from myself, um, it's the thing that stands out the most to think about the man I like to do, is his connection to McLuhan. And as Tom mentioned, what if he's right? And uh, and then he goes on to list Newton, Darwin, Freud, Einstein, and Pavlov. It's like, you know, I'm not sure Pavlov belongs to that. <laughs> The irony uh, part. But, uh, and I, I wasn't going to start out with it, but I said, what the hell? I, this is the way the article starts. I mean, you know, why not? And uh, 
because one of the things is that what, what a lot of people remember is the comparison and and when I did have uh, opportunity to talk to Tom Wolfe on a couple of occasions uh, on, about McLuhan, and one of the things he mentioned was that it's what if he's right? You know, that it was a question, and it was the question that people were asking rather than um, that rather than asserting that he's right. And, and here's how the article starts. You know, there are currently hundreds of studs of the business world breakfast food, package designers, television, network, creative department vice presidents, advertising media reps, lighting fixture, fortune heirs, smiley patent lawyers, industrial spies. We need vision board chairmen, all sorts of business studs who are all wondering if this man, Marshall McLuhan, is right. He sits in a little office on the edge of the University of Toronto that looks like the receiving bin of a second-hand bookstore, grading <laughs> papers, grading papers for days on end, wearing, well, he doesn't seem to care what he wears. If he feels like it, he just puts on the old striped tie with the plastic neckband. You just oh. snap the plastic band around your neck, and there the tie is hanging down and ready to go, pre-tied. And, and, uh, and here's the, you know, the funny thing. I mean, this, this is like one of the anecdotes that Tom Wolfe liked to tell, was that when he first met McLuhan, he was wearing like a kind of clip-on uh, tie, um, which he seemed to, to get a kick out of. Well, um, just last month, it was really, I think, the day maybe um, uh, uh, two days after Tom Wolfe passed away, I was down in Bogota, Colombia. Eric McLuhan was down there too. Um, and he gave um, actually a, we were both giving keynotes um, at a uh, doctoral program launch. Um, <coughs> and uh, he pointed to, Eric's, Eric pointed to his tie and, and and actually his son Andrew was with him and he said, you know, his father, dad's wearing a clip-on tie and he said, it's my father's. Um, yeah. and, uh, and, and in a sense, kind of, I don't know if it's ironically or poetically, um, Eric passed away the next day, uh, four days apart. So uh, we lost a couple of people associated with McLuhan at the same time. Um, but uh, the, uh, uh, I mean, that was not the only time that, that uh, Tom Wolfe was connected to McLuhan. He went on later to do a, a long uh, video, a television interview um, at McLuhan's new home in, in Toronto. And the, one of the things they talked about was the Vietnam War, it was the late 60s, and McLuhan would mention that more people are covering the war than actually fighting in it. Um, and uh, then um, in the 90s, uh, Stephanie McLuhan, one of um, Marshall McLuhan's daughters, did a, a video cassette series, three-part documentary called The Video McLuhan that Tom Wolfe introduced and, and hosted, narrated. I mean, parts of it, including his introductory 45-minute talk, uh, can be found on the McLuhan Speaks um, website. And then I got to meet Tom Wolfe the first time in 1999 when we had a um, McLuhan lecture we, that was started, uh, funded by the Canadian Consulate at Fordham University. We had it for three years and Tom Wolfe was the first lecturer. Um, and I don't know, but you know, I, the, the children's animated movie Madagascar, the animals from the Central Park Zoo, there's one point where the, I think it's the giraffe played by David Schwimmer, I'm not sure, but you know, he said, they, they don't, he doesn't want to leave because Tom Wolfe is going to be speaking at Lincoln Center. <laughs> and I don't know if it, was, if it was in reference to our thing, but I mean, I, I like to think it was. Um, <clears throat> but uh, of course, the, the other thing Tom Wolfe always liked to talk about was the time that he took McLuhan in San Francisco to this new venture, a topless club, um, that uh, and, and how 
he and I think he was with someone else and, and they were like speechless you know never having been to something like that before and, and McLuhan didn't bat an eyelash and simply said oh she's not naked she's wearing us um, <laughs> you know that is his uh, perhaps his favorite McLuhan story um, and so now I'm going to do a little plug here and this is uh, so uh, Adina Karasik and I um, worked on a collection of poetry and creative material that came out uh, a few years ago called The Medium is the Muse Channeling Marshall McLuhan. So it's all material that was inspired by McLuhan uh, having its origin in the 2011 McLuhan cent centenary. So I contacted, I wrote to Tom Wolf, oops, and uh, thank you, asked if he would, if he had could anything or could possibly provide anything. And he said, well, you know, in that What If He's Right essay, um, which is in the Pump House game, um, I have, he, he said he had a couple of poems that were part of the essay, and you could take them out and use them. So generously, uh, he allowed us to. Um, so I wanted to um, read them uh, as, as well. One of them is called Ping Pong, and this is about his experience with his teenage daughters. I walked into the living room. They rocked me with a stereo boom. No haven here downstairs at all. Nymphets frug on my wall to wall. And boogaloo in my private den and won't let poor work a daddy in. How glorious, Uber mentioned golden gulls with transistor radios plugged in their skulls, radiant with an Elysian hue from the tubercular blue of the television. Such a pure Zulu euphoria suffuses their hi-fi sensoria. How glorious. I shall stand it long as I can. This neo-tribal festival, their multimedia cut up their, the audio pervasion of their voices leaves me with two choices. Shall I simply make them shut up or extrapolate here from the destiny of Western man? And the second one is man made whole again. I gazed upon the printed page. It tore me limb from limb. I found my ears in mason jars, my feet in brogum motor cars, my khaki claws and woggy wars, but in this cockeyed eyeball age I shall not find my soul again, vile me. And then I touched the TV dial and pop, it made me whole again. <laughs> so, <laughs> that, you know, to me, um, his connection to McLuhan was of a piece with his last book, Kingdom of Speech, where he mentions McLuhan in passing, but it's part of the same continuum uh, because Kingdom of Speech, I don't think he was really hostile to evolution in general as he was to Charles Darwin as an elitist, and, and uh, he was often fighting, fighting with the New York elites you know, in favor of Wallace, um, and he had the same, made a parallel with Chomsky as a kind of elitist, um, and heard from many others how they drove out any other uh, approaches to linguistics, including the ones that we in general semantics and, and McLuhan and others in media ecology feel most aligned with, which is linguistic relativism, uh, Sapir and Whorf, um, kind of approach in Dorothy Lee. Um, and so Wolf takes Chomsky down a peg um, in, in noting how real research, as opposed to Chomsky's just sort of making it up, it was his Cartesian, you can just logic things out, and how real research has shown that Chomsky is wrong and has disproved every one of his general generalizations. So I see that this is really his final word, and in the same in the same vein. And of course, Tom Wolfe was particularly known early on for the new journalism. You know that he introduced a 
new style and you think of journalism and the ideal of objectivity impartial the sort of distanced impersonal style and here comes Wolf and others like him I mean Hunter S. Thompson comes to mind they introduce a personal style of course a literary style I wouldn't say I think it's exaggerated to say that there was no literary style at all in newspaper writing previously certainly in sports there was but he introduces that and this is again very much fits in with a McLuhan's kind of view that print media are objectively distanced impersonal whereas electronic media get us up close and personal and in depth thinking about the individual and so Tom Wolfe's new journalism in practice exemplifies what McLuhan was talking about in theory and the topic of media coverage by the way newspapers and news coverage does come up repeatedly in his work including what the right stuff and bonfire of the vanities but I do go back to to electric Kool-Aid acid test and I can't remember if I just picked it up in a library because it looked cool I do know that when I was in a teenager in my youth group they took us as a kind of excursion to see one flew over the over the cuckoo's nest and and the play blew me away I mean the movie the but the play was was incredibly powerful and I went read that I did try to read sometimes a great notion that was that may be the only novel I never finished I mean I was I just couldn't get through it but it did pique my interest about Ken Kesey and that did fit in with the what the electric Kool-Aid acid test was about with Ken Kesey the Merry Pranksters LSD and in a secondary position the great the Grateful Dead I never took acid myself I mean I read Carlos Castaneda in those days as well and got you know didn't but didn't go so far as to take peyote but it did sort of introduce this idea of thinking about consciousness and I did I didn't have a chance to go to the book but I did find some quotes online and I wanted to share some of these quotes as well starting with um, of course, Tom mentioned it, you're either on the bus or off the bus. It's just, you know, um, signature line. I, one from the electric Kool-Aid acid test, I don't remember, but I, I really like it. I'd rather be a lightning rod than a seismograph. Um, you know, that, that um, is about being actively involved. But there are a few, a couple about symbols that I think are, are, are right out of the general semantics playbook. If you label it this, then it can't be that. Mm. Sounds just like Gorzewski, doesn't it? Um, who I, um, obviously, you know, Wolf was familiar with. A and this one, very much to the heart of general semantics. That flag is a symbol we attach our emotions to, but it isn't the emotion itself, and it isn't the thing we really care about. Sometimes we don't even realize what we really care about because we get so distracted by the symbols. Mm. Right. Um, much of this, though, was about perception, and uh, which, again, is you know, general semantics is not just about language. It's about how we evaluate reality, how we take it in. And so perception, as the first step in the process of abstracting. Um, so here are some great quotes about perception everybody everybody everywhere has his own movie going his own scenario and everybody is acting his movie out like mad only most people don't know that is what they're trapped by their little script um, and then his reference to Aldous Huxley who was also someone connected to general semantics um, he said Aldous Huxley compared the brain to a reducing valve in ordinary perception, the senses send an overwhelming flood of information to the brain, which the brain then filters down to a trickle it can manage for the purpose of survival in a highly competitive world. 
man has become so rational, so utilitarian, that the trickle becomes most pale and thin. It is efficient for mere survival, but it screens out the most wondrous part of man's potential experience without his even knowing it. We're shut off from our own world. I mean, this is in, in, in a literary way, a poetic way, that Korzybski could never quite get at um, the structural differential that, that he's uh, talking about. Um, and then often people pointed to the um, pre-linguistic state um, as something to try to recapture. And so here's one, that the baby sees the world with completeness that you and I will never know again. His doors of perception have not yet been closed. He ex still experiences the moment he lives in. The inevitable bullshit hasn't constipated <laughs> his cerebral cortex, cortex yet. He still sees the world as it really is, while we sit here, left with only a dim, historical version of it, manufactured for us by words and official bullshit and so forth and so on. And then, and, and this is uh, Neil Cassidy, and he's really writing about, uh, Cassidy had this philosophy, I mean, he was into speed, amphetamines, uh, and the idea of speeding up his responses to try to get to the present. And here's the description of it. A person has all sorts of lags built into him, Casey is saying. Once the most basic is the sensory lag the lag between the time your senses receive something and you are able to react. One thirtieth of a second is the time it takes if you are the most alert person alive, and most people are a lot slower than that. You can't go any faster than that. We are all doomed to spend our, the rest of our lives watching a movie of our lives. We're always acting on what has just finished happening. It happened at least one thirtieth of a second ago. We think we are in the present, but we aren't. The present we know is only, is only a movie of the past, and we will really never be able to control the present through ordinary means. Right? And that's like, especially for teenagers, like, ooh, oh. <laughs> right? Um, and, and then there's some that is, you know, it's kind of spiritual and mystical in a way. Um, also, you know, in, in a sense, connecting to Jungian psychology. Um, one about the merry pranksters. The pranksters never talked about synchronicity by name, but they were more and more attuned to the principle. Obviously, according to this principle, man does not have free will. There is no use in his indulging in a lifelong competition to change the structure of the little environment he seems to be trapped in. But one could see the larger pattern and move with it, go with the flow, and accept it and rise above one's immediate environment and even alter it by accepting the larger pattern and growing with it. And you know, here we have the environmental metaphor, the ecological thinking, and, and go with the flow was such a big part of that zeitgeist, you know. I mean, certainly was the way I managed my life, you know, <laughs> for, for what it's worth. Um, I'm not saying uh, it was necessarily the right thing to do, but that was the way we lived. Um, another one, the world was simply and sheerly divided into the aware, those who had the experience of being vessels of the divine, and a great mass of the unaware, the unmusical, the unattuned. It's funny, the unmusical was in ancient Greece the equivalent of our term illiterate. Mm -hmm. right? People who are not aware, are not educated. Um, and one about the Grateful Dead, uh, I had to include, the Grateful Dead did not play in sets. No eight numbers to a set, then a 25-minute break, and so on, four or five sets, and then the closeout. The dead might play one number for five minutes or 30 minutes. Who kept time? Who could keep time with history cut up in slices? And this was in reference to the actual acid test, that is, the experiments they did with taking LSD. Um, I also thought it was interesting to look at, uh, from the right stuff, the description of 
the media, uh, the press. And he writes about, you know, in relation to the astronauts, the Mercury program, which I know is very much uh, simpatico with, with Tom on, on that. You know, I mean, it was so central to the baby boomer experience of growing up in that time. But he writes, it was as if the press in America, for all its vaunted independence, were a great colonial animal, an animal made up of countless clustered organisms responding to a central nervous system. In the late 1950s, as in the late 1970s, the animals seemed determined that in all matters of national importance, the proper emotion, the seemly sentiment, the fitting moral tone should be established and should prevail, and all information that muddied the tone and weakened the feeling should simply be thrown down the memory hole. In a later period, this impulse of the animal would take the form of blazing indignation about corruption, abuses of power, and even minor ethical lapses among public officials. Here, in April of 1959, it took the form of a blazing patriotic passion for the seven test pilots who had volunteered to go into space. In either case, the animal's fundamental concern remained the same. The public, the populace, the citizenry must be provided with correct feelings. Mm -hmm. uh, um, and I just, the last few, I'm thinking about politics. Um, from the bonfire of the vanities, um, and I just, you know, that concluding point with the, with the judge going, be decent, you know, yeah. is so, <laughs> so central today. But, you know, two words, bullshit reigns. Another, a liberal is a conservative who has been arrested. <laughs> um, <laughs> And then this isn't this. I'm not sure what the origin of this is, but I mean this this speaks so much to today. A lie may fool someone else, but it tells you the truth. You're weak. Um, like Trump to hear this. One last thing. <laughs> One last thing. This is a segment from A Man in Full. So it also speaks to what we're dealing with. One of the few freedoms that we have as human beings that cannot be taken away from us is the freedom to assent to what is true and to deny what is false. Nothing you can give me is worth surrendering that freedom for. At this moment, I'm a man with complete tranquility. I've been a real estate developer for most of my life, and I can tell you that a developer lives with the opposite of tranquility which is perturbation. You're perturbed about something all the time. You build your first development, and right away you want to build a bigger one, and you want a bigger house to live in, and if it ain't in Buckhead, you might as well cut your wrists. As soon as you got that, you want a plantation, tens of thousands of acres, devoted solely to shooting quail, because you know of four or five developers who've already got that. And as soon as you got that, you want a place on Sea Island and a Hatteras crew and a spread northeast of Bughead near the Chattahoochee where you can ride a horse during the week when you're not down at the plantation. Plus, a ranch in Wyoming, Colorado, or Montana because truly successful men in Atlanta and New York all got their ranches. And of course, now you need a private plane, a big one too, a jet, a Gulfstream 5 because who's got the patience and the time and the humility to fly commercially, even to the plantation, <laughs> much less out to a ranch. What is it you're looking for in this endless quest? Tranquility. You think if only you can acquire enough worldly goods, enough recognition, enough eminence, you'll be free. There'll be nothing more to worry about, and instead you become a bigger and bigger slave to how you think others are judging you. That's good. Wow. Amen. Wow. That's true. <laughs> Over to you, Jen. Well, <laughs> that was great. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. <laughs> you get more headaches when you have more stuff. And uh, we were talking about earlier tonight that um, uh, all of Wolf's work, a common theme, 
in the New York world um, that he inevitably presented man as a status-seeking animal, mm -hmm. concerned above all about the opinions of one's peers. And Wolf said, status is on everyone's mind all the time, which um, you know, follows what Lance said. And uh, Kurt Vonnegut said of him, he knows everything. I wish he had headed the Warren Commission. <laughs> He was, it's quite the fellow. What, what uh, amuses me, though, is the way he dressed in the white suit all the time, and the impossibly white cuffs, white collars, and ties. Uh, was he just living out his opinion of that men as a, or humans are status seeking people? Did he want to embody that by his appearance? Do you, do you think? Uh, do I think oh, I yes. Don't think Shoot. So. Mr. Mind, last night I'm in the writer's group of West Hampton. And the guy turns around to me, because I read last last night, and he said, Marty, you always read last. And I said, mm. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so anyway, I'll read last. But it'd be yeah. what these guys were saying was actually kind of interesting to me, because I'll change my talk based on what I've heard. But before I, before I do, the, do what I was going to say, uh, I only met, unlike Lance, I only met Tom Wolf once. And that was the AKML last year. And I sat next to him at dinner. And it turned out he was a political conservative, mm -hmm. which is I'm kind of the opposite. But, <laughs> but we had a nice discussion on politics. I mean, a civil discussion. We weren't yelling at each other. I listened to him. He listened to me. And I thought, wow, this could happen maybe somewhere else. Uh, and the other thing is, uh, you know, he was, I guess, 87 last year, or maybe close to 88. And he was going to sign books at the end of the AKML. They had books there. And the thing went on really much longer than it should have. And his wife said, you know, Tom's got to go home. He's got to take medicine. And I said, oh, could you please stay? you got all these books. Can you please sign them? And he said, well, I will. And the wife said, oh, no, he's got to go home. And he went against his wife. <laughs> and he stayed and signed all the books. Yeah, so I'm always and he died of, <laughs> and we were the cause of it. <laughs> <laughs> I always felt guilty about that. No, no, he died much later. But anyway, but what I'm, the thing is, I, I'm going to remember Tom really as, a, as really as a smart guy and a nice guy. Mm -hmm. I mean, a lot of smart people around, but not that many nice people. And he was both. Anyway, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, one book. Two fellows talked about a lot of books. And this is the book, The Painted Word. It's a short book. He's my role model. And in many ways, not only is he my role model as far as short with illustrations, but he also is satiric. And I, I like that writing style. And he was satiric. When we last mentioned in his uh, talk about bullshit and about elitists, and Tom Wolf, I think, had someone in the gut wanting to go against elitists and people he thought would give me bullshit. So the painted word really is about him going after the art critics in the art world. And I'll read you a little bit about it. I'll read you the beginning. But he also wrote a book called, well, how many of you have read the painted word? Oh, well, if you haven't, it's short. And <laughs> <laughs> it has <laughs> illustrations. It has illustrations. <laughs> and, and it's a fun read. So please, right? Get it. I mean, okay. Imagine to be unaudible. I don't know, but anyway, it's pretty good. Um, the other, another book that he wrote, which is pretty good, is from Bauhaus to Our House, hmm. where he does a satiric take on architecture, which is similar to this. And of course, he did the thing in the '60s where um, he went into the trash the party to let a burst he was throwing <laughs> to the Black Panthers. <laughs> and you know the story of how he crashed that party. Uh, he actually is interesting. He went to, uh, I think, David Halberstam, his famous novelist, and a friend of him. And he went to visit to David's office. And when you're at the office, David Halberstam had this invitation to the Leonard Bernstein party. And Wolf noticed it and copied down the number of RSVP <laughs> and called up and said, Tom Wolf, RSVP. And they put him on the list. <laughs> So he had his, you know, the Jewish, he had chutzpah. <laughs> <laughs> so he walked into the party with a notebook. So they knew they were going to be, they knew it was Tom Wolf, and he took notes, and he came out with this really smashing satire against Bernstein. It was wonderful. Anyway, so let's get back to the painful work. So I'm going to, uh, 
Franz Klein, Mark Rothko, and Barnett Newman all started out as figurative artists before moving to abstraction in the late 1940s. Was that just the way their work was naturally headed, or did ideas from critics like Clement Greenberg influence the direction of their work? And then he talks about the critics, etc. Now, in one part of the book, Wolf writes about how critics have to be constantly ahead of the game, and this is what he says, which is interesting to me, maybe to you. He says, in an age of avant-gardism, no critic can stop a new style by meeting it head on. To be against what is new is not to be modern. Not to be modern is to write yourself out of the scene. Not to be in the scene is to be nowhere. In an age of avant-gardism, the only possible strategy to counteract a new style which you detest is to leapfrog it. You abandon your old position and your old artist leapfrog over the new style, land beyond it, point back to it and say, oh, that's nothing. I found something newer and better way out here. Wolf observes that if you have to keep moving farther and farther out to the leading edge, eventually you're going to go over the edge. <laughs> and arguably that's what's happened to painting during the time period he examined. And he talks about Clement Greenberg had the theory of flatness. Paintings have to be flat. And so Wolf is saying, how flat can you get? How <laughs> abstract can you get? How many traditional pictorial elements can you completely eliminate from your work and still have a painting? Have you ever seen these paintings in like, the art museums, which are all one color? Yes. Have you ever thought? Lache was one of them. Yeah, there was the other. If you had, I don't know about that. Is there? Yeah, the, uh, the white painting. I forget the name of it. Well, the one that did the white painting. White on white, right? Well, the one who did white painting was Rauschenberg back in 1951 in a famous white canvas. And basically, when you would just walk in and would see the painting, what you would really see is people reflected in the painting, looking at the painting, which is interesting. So Rauschenberg was sort of ahead of the curve in 51. But I think Wolf might have seen these paintings. That might have been a motivation to write the book. He might have said, gee, I could do that. I mean, have you ever seen art and artwork and said, gee, I could do that? <laughs> yes. Yeah. They have a black painting. Right. The... And have you ever asked, what is art? Yeah. Well, I have a go stick to the end. Marshall McLuhan said famously, art is anything you can get away with. <laughs> yeah. Right? Great. Yeah. I always, my definition always was art is anything that's hanging up in a museum <laughs> or in a gallery. But just a quick aside, yeah, they had a, a modern artist that had some kind of, I don't know, art exhibit at uh, the Museum of Modern Art, mm -hmm. and the maintenance man cleaned it up and threw it out. <laughs> For real. It was, in the <laughs> might have been a critic. <laughs> <laughs> he probably was a critic. I'm, I'm going to just finish this quickly. There's other things to say, but since you're all going to read the book, I can skip some of the talk. That's right. You can read it before the night. Then you could yes. read. You could read it before the night. So I can read it to you before the night. So. <laughs> but I'm just going to do the epilogue because I think it's such an interesting concept what he does with the epilogue. So in the book's epilogue, Wolf argues that we will eventually see the descriptions of, of the real art, as the descriptions, rather, is the real art. In other words, the theory will become the real art. And the art, as the small labels that describe the theory. So what he basically is saying, what the critics will do someday in exhibits, and he predicted this would happen by the year 2000. I don't think it's happening then. But it might happen in the future, <coughs> you never know. And he was saying that Art critics would have their theories or comments on theories <laughs> up in museums in big huge, eight and a half by eleven on the wall. And next to their words would be little labels with pictures. So it would be the reverse, <laughs> which would describe the theory, or which the theory would be describing. So it's the reverse of what you go when you see a museum, which is the picture and the label describing it. Here the label would be the art, and the picture would be the theory. So I thought in terms of general semantics, what happens is the word is the territory right. and the physical art is the map, which I thought was an interesting way to look at it. But then I ended that Marshall McLuhan said that art is anything you can get away with. And based on what he's written in this book, I suspect Tom Wolfe would have agreed. So that's my point.
people would not know that is kindergarten art. Who said the heart is in the eye of the beholder? Beauty. Beauty is oh, yeah. Beauty. Yeah. I'm sorry. This quote. But you know, McClune was also fond of the Margaret Mead quote that she um, was. Uh, I, I was. In, I think it was in the shore, but she asked the natives to said, "Show me your art, um, artworks. I'd like to see them." And they said, "We have no art. We do everything as well as we can." I did think, though. I mean, it, it, that kind of kind of um, the same similar thing happens in the literary world, where with, yeah. with deconstruction, structuralist uh, work, the theory becomes more prominent than the than the. just so happened I was reading it at the time I was 16 and I was learning to fly and the, the first solo I took the man just got out the back seat and, it, and told me it's yours so first of all I was tremendously scared and uh, then they uh, I was in a glider actually they, uh, they uh, sent me up and then at the end of that the tow line I had to let go and then I realized what he was talking about all the pilots were talking about in the right stuff the, the, the tremendous freedom the control over the entire world the actual sense of accomplishment aggrandizement the ego to me that's what I got from the right <coughs> stuff I kind of realized that at the moment I was flying there without an engine and I was on top of the world and doing it my way that's what the right stuff meant to me at that time. The second course, we always have to bring it back to the first, which is the art art. Yes, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> that is the unfortunate. <laughs> but, but in a way, the right stuff, we've been talking about that, is a kind of passionless, a kind of technical mentality um, where you can just. You know, not go, oh my god, you know, I'm, I'm like way up in the sky in this big heavy object, how can this possibly be? But that, you know, I mean, that's Apollo 13 in a way, and the astronauts is that they, they really were like kind of, uh, and, and I think pilots generally, you know, they have to be technical creatures who um, do not get emotional and simply follow through. Um, and, and if you ever saw the movie The Martian, or the, I guess you read the book, I don't know if it's books anymore. Um, but you know, the way he explains it is in the same vein that, you know, you don't think, you know, you don't lose hope and think, oh my God, what do I do? It's impossible. You just focus on what's the next thing I have to do? And then what's the next thing after that? And what's the next thing after that? And that that's how you get through. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yes, yes. Yeah, we do a lot of cool items. Yeah. The state and buddy base in Washington. We can design the shit out of this. Yeah. Um, that is science, right? Yeah. Objectivity. Disconnected, distanced. Uh, point of view. Oh, okay. well, you can you enjoy it when you enjoy it last week? Yeah, 
hard to say I'm, it's just something I like. It sounds like a boo if you say it's just something I like. Right. I it speaks to me. It speaks to me. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah, that's right. Actually, had he lived long, he might have written a book about yeah. enophile. Well, but it's also it's an act of translation to take the work in any symbolic form yeah. and to talk about it or to write about it and to put it, to try to make sense of it in discursive terms. You don't have to do that. Stand there and experience it, and not say I like it or I don't like it. To not say anything, yeah. you know, th that's a communicative transference of, you know, of, of taking in through your perception, right, what you're looking at or what you're listening to. But the moment that we start to talk about it, we're changing apples into oranges, and it's a different thing, which is of the structural differential you're doing on the side of the apple. And then we have to get non-verbal, non right. the, 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 the below the verbal, the structure just below the point where we begin to speak about it. So we, we reach a point where we In the old patronage way, the you know that the rich, wow. the, the king or whatever can just say you know I like this or you know I don't like this and off with his head. Uh, you know, in the new way though, the the um, patrons have to put on some pretense of understanding what the artist is doing. That's right. Um, and, and that and that's where things have changed. And One of his coinages, and I mentioned in the write-up for this, is status figure, yes. yeah. which kind of right. combines the right stuff with right. the big word and, right. uh, and radical chic. Yeah. Yeah. But this isn't all about communication and how we communicate. It's all about how we communicate the ideas and how the public receives them, whether it's a book or a play or whatever. Well, the person who starts it, you know, Wolf says it's reason. Duchamp starts it. Duchamp starts it when he takes a urinal uh, oh, yeah. and lays it on the floor on its side and calls it a fountain. And what he's saying is, what is art? Mm -hmm. And why isn't this fountain?
times we can use the book and trash the book. Why? Well, try to figure out why. Oh, because, yeah, right. because so in the first two pages, Wolf went after the critic of the Times. So the book of oh, is yeah. probably a friend of the critic. Stupid. So he kills, I mean, even oh. the title, forget the title of you, I think, uh, Stupid Man or something like this, he really crashes, <laughs> he just crashes all of the whole review. Oh. And he starts saying, you know, Wolf says, why don't I start in the 1920s? He knows nothing about it. Art started way before the 1920s. And he modern goes on, art. modern yeah. art. And he goes on and on and on. And some of the points actually make sense to me. I think what Wolf was basically doing here, like he did with the Kingdom of Speech, he's a rebel. He throws things out, and you have to think about it. It's not exactly 100% accurate, and you could argue against him in many ways, but he's being satirical. And challenging. And challenging. Okay, now you're in the search for the truth, or something truer. You know, Stevie Cohen, the founder of Stock Capital, a self-made financial genius. The first day he traded stock, his net, net profit was $37,000, oh. which was years ago. And it just struck me because it was in the Times, the arch section. He had paid 10, like he's very successful by the way, extremely in Greenwich, but he paid $10 million for a shark that was cut in half. And then, like a year and a half later, the shark started falling apart. And Damien Hurd said, Don't worry, I'll get you another one. And you don't have to pay for it. Think, wow, I could, I could have done that. You should have done that. I know. <laughs> <laughs> but also, why do wealthy people buy art? In a way, they buy it as an investment, but also because it separates them from the wealthy people who don't have art. They buy it as an investment. But also because it separates them from the wealthy people who don't have art. So if you're a wealthy person with art, you're sort of one step above. Yeah. You're more cultured. What if you're a wealthy person with bad art? Well, what is bad art? Ah. Ah. What is art? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and then, Anything I, I, you can get away with. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. so, what about artists of the antenna of the culture? What about the other things that influence that? Well, that's that's Ezra Pound. That? Ezra Pound said, he quotes, was, the artist is the antenna of the race. Oh, really? Uh, oh. Yeah. But, I think, I think but for that, he meant uh, the um, really good artists. <laughs> you know, that, that they are the, ones, well, the ones who are, um, really are sensing what, what is coming. It's the parallel of Vonnegut's um, phrase that the writer is the canary in the coal mine. Yeah, you know, but that, that, that idea. But yeah. when you talk about sensing what's coming, are you talking about it in terms of discourse as art? Or are you talk who can tell you what's coming in a painting? Who can tell you what's coming in a piece of music without words? That's true. It's about sense perception. I'm going to have to that for this for I think, I think. Before the modern era, you said you said kings. But I, my earliest recollection is that the church was the author or the patron of the arts, yes. and they said to the artist, "Show me something with purity." So they painted the Madonna. Show me something with holiness. They put a couple of angels over the shoulders. They they, they told the 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 painter. The, the symbols that they wanted the, to be uh, generated, and then became the pictures and the, and the things that became, I think even Mozart, his patron was also a bishop somewhere, and they tried to get the king to take him over. They told him what they wanted the, the music, the art to be before he wrote it. But all of the same thing Financiers like today, they just fly. But that's shit. Yes. Um, I'm sorry. From the uh, but what's what's happening from Rome? It's Rome through the Renaissance. Is exactly what you said. They're commissioning works, but they're commissioning works for the cathedral. And so it's it's all religious iconography. It's all biblical stories in visual form. Right. And then you know Botticelli is the shift. That's what he's doing. Was Paul. Am I right? Paul? Right. Botticelli is the shift that. Sorry, this guy. <laughs> Don't shake him, you're going to respond. Hey, you're ruining the shot. Botticelli <laughs> is, is doing the commissioned works, and then suddenly Botticelli is painting things that aren't biblical in, in their uh, theme. And 
things, you know, you, you may not turn to the heating and off we go. Off we go. So what's ruling the world now? Is that art or music or whatever? <coughs> Who is the one that's making decisions of what's going to be great art and what isn't? I think my, I think, I think art is in the eye of the beholder. I know beauty is the right word, but I think maybe art is in the eye of the beholder. It is or it isn't, depending on how you feel. A shark it is or it isn't. A white piece of paper, black piece of paper. It is or it isn't. If you decide it is, you pay for it. If you do, you're done. Well, the designing, They follow them. They follow, they follow right. them. So basically, yeah, but basically that, that's, those are the people that are deciding what art is. They're the gatekeepers. I, I love I loved the, the uh, children's or young adult books, a series of unfortunate events, which mm -hmm. if you haven't read them, I highly recommend them to you. The fellow, I mean, his pen name is Lemony Snicket. He's someone, <laughs> oh, yeah. someone who a has thing. a yeah. wonderful... Biggest objection. <laughs> they get dirty so fast. Right. But you know, it's not just an objection. You think that's a marketing tool. Lord that's why you have 20 of them. We think Tom yeah. Wolf, what's the first thing? Well, that's what you think. Without the white suit, Gates Lee is dressed the same way. Yes. Mm -hmm. Always in a tailored suit. Immaculate. Yes. 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 Yes
write stuff at, at the book. It's number 52 on the MLA 1999 list of the century's 100 best English language books ever. And um, so that stood the test of time. I wonder what he felt about that. <laughs> he felt $5, uh, $5 million. He would pay $5 million for the, the rights. Interesting that, that he decided to do that because you know that was a common thing. You know, I think even into, into the 60s, um, but we get to you know past that point uh, you know, with the demise of general interest magazines like like the Saturday Evening Post. 
time. You just don't have that done anymore, where you have a, um, a an author, a novelist, who writes, you know, as Dickens did in the 19th century, or, or H. G. Wells did. Um, you know, to do a novel in installments, mm -hmm. writing as you go along. You know, that kind of forces you. It's like you've got a deadline. Um, and, and that becomes the rough draft because the bomb part of the vanities then was changed significantly. You know, for uh, for example, the main character was an author in the in the Rolling Stone version, and he becomes a sort of a financier, a Wall Street guy, yeah, and in the later version. So, uh, and I think that willingness to do that though goes back to. Again, the fact that he's a journalist, he was a journalist mm -hmm. at, at heart. I mean, I remember reading for Charlotte, Sim I'm Charlotte Simmons, he did a lot of research. He yeah, went he down, you know, it's hard, I mean, what was he in the 70s at yeah. the time? And he's going down to college yeah. campuses to talk to, to young women about yeah. their sexual yeah. experiences. I mean, that's fascinating. That Today has been a tough assignment. Me too, I think you have a problem with it. Oh yeah, they did. Thirty old boy. Right. But there um, goes the career. He was asked several times uh, from the outside, "What did he think that uh, George Bush always carrying that book around with him?" You that he would. Um, that she, what is it, Charlotte? I am Charlotte Simmons. I am Charlotte Simmons. It's a uh, uh, a book about college experiences, drinking, and sex, and all the things.
that you can start a hotel, call it Trump, and it's going to be a success. And uh, Tom is saying all of these things in very non-judgmental, yeah. I think, like a clear-thinking way. You just want to say, okay, all right, you are making sense. And he's a, he's a lovable megalomaniac. People get a big kick out of going to his office and behind his desk is a wall of pictures of himself in the news. The childishness makes him seem honest. Many people have pointed out that he doesn't present policy programs. There's a great scene in one of George Bernard Shaw's novels involving an old politician who's talking to his young assistant, and they're going over a speech that he's about to deliver. The young man says, sir, what, what you have said is all principles. There's no program. And the old politician says, ah, now you're catching on. Now you get it. And that just seems to be what Trump is doing. And then the, I found this very interesting because it's observational to me, not judgmental. If you go through our history, Tom Wolf says, the strictly intellectual component of the presidency is not at all that important. Just look at Reagan. He was a huge success, and, but was considered an idiot by half of the people in politics. I remember Kissinger was at a university once holding a seminar for 10 students and didn't know that his remarks were being recorded. Kissinger said something like, you know, when you first meet Reagan, you spend a half an hour with him and you leave saying, oh my God, how could the future of the free country be dependent on such a stupid guy? But then Kissinger said, and yet every movie he makes is right. Kissinger was highly embarrassed that this came out, but Trump, or Wolf's point is, the point is that decision making is not necessarily an intellectual talent. One of the stories I remember about Reagan is that the first time he went to Germany to speak about the Berlin Wall, um, and Reagan had a discussion with his advisors about whether or not he should say the wall should come down. And all his advisors said, oh, no, no, don't say anything like that. And they created all kinds of other phrases for Reagan to say. But when Reagan gave the speech, out of the blue, he said, Mr. Gorbachev, tear down that wall. And it was a real turning point in the Cold War. It was just Reagan's gut reaction to the fact and history-making comment. And you know, this is just pre-election. The interviewer says, what about Hillary Clinton versus Trump? She seems like a political dud, conservative newspaper, who's very vulnerable. Wolf said, Bill, he says, so, he says, Bill Clinton can take over a room with the warmth of his personality. He can remember all the women's names, and so on. Hillary is just so standoffish. She's so unlike Bill in so many ways. Then concludes with, it's going to be a much more fascinating election than I would have thought. And I have noticed that in publishing, for example, companies are postponing a lot of books unless they are political because they think there's going to be so much interest in this election that people aren't going to be out buying books anymore other than political. And I read this because it's just such clear thinking and really not going either way. And it, it just makes sense. And on Mars. And it was very and it was two years before the election. And he did say that he voted um, a writer for um, um, Gary Johnson. Uh, Ron Paul once was Gary Johnson other time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.
Um, so, new journalism is supposed to be dead? If so, why? I don't think so. Who said that? Um, I, I've read it in several places. It, um, in the 80s, it lost its, its charm. Well, but yeah. where is the outlet for it now? You know, you mentioned Rolling Stone. Yeah. I, I've never seen Rolling Stone magazine as a paragon of journalism. Yeah. Although, yeah, I have well, a lot of stuff over the years that was terrific. Oh, yeah. yeah. But even Rolling Stone now has followed the model of, you know, what they call them in the UK, the lab magazines. We're, gonna, we're not going to do feature pieces anymore. We're not going to do feature length stuff. The, the readership can't read it. So we're yeah. going to have a column at most with an image attached to it. Mm -hmm. And, you know, how do you do new journalism? We might say journalism is but, but I mean, if we think of new journalism as, as specifically a literary style, as, mm -hmm. as new print journalism, I mean, it de its demise is concurrent with the demise of print journalism. Because in what sense is any any aspect of broadcast journalism? New journalism, um, you know, even even with the supposedly impartiality of of say a um, Dan Rather, I mean, it, it was always um, quite clear that, that his distaste for uh, for, for the Bushes. Uh, so um, you know, you can't you can't omit the personal aspect from television. journalism was this, I, I think, you know, McLuhan had a term, hybrid energy, mm -hmm. which is, you know, this brief moment when culture connects, um, and, you know, in this sense, the brief moment when print culture was still, was on its way out, but was still with us, and electronic culture was coming in, and the combination of the two gave rise to new forms. I think rock and roll as well, you know, so what, why was music so incredibly vital and, and powerful, you know, in the rock era, and then as we get to the end of the 20th century, it just sort of like goes, you know, it, it, it becomes this kind of commercial product that, that is to really uninteresting. Uh, it, it was this hybrid energy, and I think new journalism was at the same time was of, of that that you can't. We won't get another Tom. I think is that you know the end of it because we're not going to get somebody who is a writer in that sense and a product of print culture. When was he born? In um, eight weeks ago. He died. No, when, he, when was he born? He was from the then. He was from the thirties. So right. Yes, yeah, so he's growing up. He's still in, in a an illiterate and literary culture. Oh, yeah. You know he. he is not a pro uh, baby boomer. Is not a product of television. Uh, we're not going to get that anymore. Um, somebody coming out of that and yet encountering yeah. this new electronic environment, being inspired by it, producing something brand new. It's just it's gone. It's over. Yeah, that's interesting. Okay. It's like the end of the written word. Right. It's more visual. And it's post literate. What? But but. Tom, is it dumbing down? I don't know. It is dumbing down. As a card-carrying meteorologist, yes. uh, here we are talking. Right? The original form means of communicating via verbal language. We're still, so the idea that print and, and uh, or text on a screen is, is going to go away, is going to collapse, yeah, your training says no. We'll find a way. It might not be as vital a form as it was pre electronic. Right. But, you know, when we got the bid, we lose it. Well, I, I wasn't saying it was going away, I was just saying that it was the moment where print, the print mentality that had, was still holding on, mm -hmm. and the electronic mentality was new. Right. It was brand new. Nobody, you know, we, were, we weren't used to it, which meant it was very 
kind of visible to us, it didn't become routine and, and accepted. And we're um, so now into the electronic mentality. Right. That's Certain segments of the, of the civilization that still will not be involved in the electronics. They won't watch television, they won't watch films. That's why they're streaming Netflix. So we can do what you want. <laughs> we don't talk about that. In terms of news, you know, I. I
Thank you. Anyway, we're really glad um, that you all should Yes, in. very much. Thank you, Thank you on behalf of the yes. New York Society for General Semantics. And the Institute of General Semantics. And the Institute of General Semantics. Which is the Semantics. international organization. You all did a great job. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.